Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event where we cover anything that may be of interest to librarians across the state. We do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, um, and they are recorded. So if you are unable to join us on Wednesday mornings, you can always go and watch our uh, recorded sessions. We have all, all of them up here on our website, so you can go back and watch any of them that you may have missed or anything that you want to watch again. Um, we do have uh, commission staff that do presentations for us here, and we do have guest speakers as we have today. Um, this morning we have on the line with us uh, Jessica Chamberlain, who is the director of our Northeast Library System here in Nebraska. And um, hello, Jessica, I've got you unmuted. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and um, she's going to talk to us about this great program, Every Child Ready to Read at Your Library. Um, great program for getting your kids into reading, early literacy. Um, and I'm going to hand over, um, so welcome, Jessica. And I am going to hand over uh, presenter control to you now so that you can show what you've got. Okay. Now let me get that going to a slideshow here. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, we can see. I can see your slides. All good. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't want to, to play nice and, and be full screen here. There we go. There okay. it goes. Yep, we see it now. <laughs> All right, should I go ahead and get started yep, then? go right ahead. You're on. Okay. As Krista said, my name is Jessica Chamberlain. I'm the director of the Northeast Library System here in Nebraska, and I wanted to talk to you about Every Child Ready to Read at Your Library. This is an initiative that's a combined initiative between the Public Library Association and the Association of Library Services to Children. And this is their second edition of this. The first edition of this program came out in 2004. And I just would like to know if you could all chat into the chat box if you have done this program in its first version or you're familiar with what the first version of Every Child Ready to Read is, would you just chat in yes? And if you are not, chat in no. So I know where everybody is coming from. Okay, so far we have one no, one yes. Okay, and a couple more no's coming in. All right, so it looks like the majority of people uh, that responded at least are not familiar with the first one, heard of it but haven't done it. Okay, great. All right, well, we, um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about what the first program was what they did to update it, and then we're going to give you a preview of uh, a workshop that is for parents and caregivers. So, so about halfway through the program, we're going to stop being librarians and we're going to pretend to be parents and caregivers for a little while. So, Basically, um, about 11 years ago, in 2000, the Association of Library Service to Children and the Public Library Association um, work together to start developing a program that would address this, this problem that they were just seeing so many kids were starting kindergarten without the skills that they needed to be ready to read. And they wanted to know how public libraries could address this problem. Um, so, so they decided to see what they could do to come up with an answer. And what they came up with was a program that they called Every Child Ready to Read, and it was a parent education initiative. And that was what was so different and revolutionary about Every Child Ready to Read when it first came out. Um, it came out in 2004, and so many of our programs, you know, story time and children's programming that we do, it's focused on the child, which is great. But what Every Child Ready to Read tried to do was to focus on the parent, and it was a parent education initiative. If the primary adults in a child's life could learn more about the importance of early literacy, they thought that that would um, multiply the effect that the library could have you know, multiple times in these children's lives. Because once the parents, or once the children walked out of the library doors, it was up to that parent or caregiver to 
you know, to be working with that child. So it was, you are your child's first teacher was a big push of that, and you can see that little poster and that purple stripe on the side, that was the poster for it, and it says, what you do helps your child get ready to read. And that was really the focus on it. But after about four years, they decided it was time to review it, see what was good about it, what could be better about the program. And so in 2008, they you know, got together and they had a big literature review, and Dr. Susan B. Newman and Dr. Donna Solano reviewed the program and also reviewed more current research, because the research that was included in the first Every Child Ready to Read was from um, you know, 1999 and 2000. And you know, as it got to be 2008, we're looking at research that's already a decade old, and they wanted to make sure that they were up to date with what the current, you know, views and research had to say. So they looked at what else was out there, and they decided to make some changes to the second edition. And so what they did, the first edition focused on, I'm going to go back a couple slides and show you that. Um, Well, maybe. There we go. If you can see that what you do helps your child get ready to read, these were the six skills that they focused on in the first version. They focused on narrative skills, print motivation, vocabulary, print awareness, letter knowledge, and phonological awareness. And while those are wonderful, the meaning of what those skills are is not immediately apparent uh, to, to parents and caregivers, to people who aren't immersed in an early literacy kind of educational world. So that was one of the biggest things that they did to make a change, is that besides being uh, based on updated research, they also removed those six skills that were confusing and seemed overly academic for a lot of people. And they replaced them with five practices, which makes a lot more sense, because the five practices are talking, singing, reading, writing, and playing. And this is what they want to encourage parents to do in a thoughtful way with their kids. And, and these are non-intimidating. You know, it's not scary to say, I want you to talk with your child or play with your child. But to say, you should be teaching your child phonological awareness is a little daunting for a lot of people. So they removed a lot of the academic jargon, went to the five practices, and, um, and also talked about having a stimulating early literacy environment in the home, and that's something we'll talk about a little bit later as we get to the parent education part of it. Uh, the other thing they did, if anyone ever worked with this in the past, it took a lot of preparation on the speaker's side um, to present these workshops, because what they wanted you to do was present workshops to parents, and there were different age groups. There was early talkers, talkers, and pre-readers. And as a presenter who, and I did these workshops at libraries many times, it took a lot of preparation on my part to get these ready for the, for the parents that were coming. With this new program, it, you have to buy the binder or the, all the uh, materials and they give you a DVD or a CD loaded with things but the handouts are much better. The presentations are all ready for you. This PowerPoint that I'm showing was already preloaded on the, the CD, and they really make it a lot easier for presenters to have some, some presentation-ready materials. And they can also all be customized with your library's logo and your own pictures and that kind of thing, which is nice. So that was just another update that they made. So they when we talk about they're based on updated research, I want to highlight that a little bit. And, and what is this research that they're basing this on? Because that's another big push of Every Child Ready to Read, is that this is a scientifically studied, research-based uh, program that's a parent initiative for the public libraries. So the studies that they based it on were the Prevention of Reading Difficulties, and this was from 1998, the National Reading Panel Report, from 2000, which focused on preschool children through age nine, the National Literacy Panel um, on Language for Minority Children and Youth, and this is from 2006, and the National Early Literacy Panel from 2008, which focused on birth through kindergarten years of children. And what they found was that the results of these studies were very consistent. They emphasized the same things over and over that there are certain skills that children need in order to become successful readers. 
So what they found as these uh, consistent results was that children's reading success starts at birth. It starts with positive language and literacy experiences from the very beginning. And that if children develop pre-reading skills before they start kindergarten, they can focus on learning to read once they begin school. And one thing I want to clarify about this is this program is not designed to teach children how to read. It's about giving kids the skills they need so that when they start school, they are ready to read and they're ready to learn. Because children who start kindergarten ready to learn have a greater success throughout their school years. They're more likely to, to read at or above their um, grade level by the end of second grade. And those who are reading at or above grade level by the end of fourth grade are much more likely to graduate from high school and to be successful readers and learners throughout their life. So all the research is showing us that it's important how kids get started in life and with their reading life is an important predictor of their success later on. So this is imperative that libraries be part of this because this is, you know, the success of our community and the future success of the children in our community. We can be a part of that. We can be an important part of their development in these early years. The other thing that they found was that learning to read involves two key sets of skills and they call them decoding and comprehension. And the decoding skills are they need to decode print to understand that the words they hear and say can be written with letters, which is the code, and that they need to learn that letters represent the sounds they hear in words. Children need to understand and comprehend what print says, obviously, that's what comprehension is, and so they need to have lots of background knowledge about the world around them so that they can understand it, what, they what they are reading. So they need both of these skills to be successful readers. But not all skills are equal. Well, another thing that they found was that um, the decoding skills are, are constrained skills, which means um, you know they have a fixed endpoint. Once you know all the letters of the alphabet, you don't need to continue to learn those. You're going to know those pretty much for the rest of your life. Uh, once you know the sounds that the letters make, again, that's something that has a beginning and an end. But unconstrained skills are things like vocabulary and reading comprehension because these skills go on and continue to improve and continue to develop throughout a person's life. Even as an adult, you learn new vocabulary words or you gain more knowledge about the world that helps you understand what you're reading even better. So public libraries are a natural place for children to learn both of these skills. You know, decoding are the constrained skills, comprehension, the unconstrained skills. The public library is a natural fit for this. Um, what I want to point out here, too, is this is a key difference between the first version and the second version of Every Child Ready to Read, is that these constrained and unconstrained skills and decoding and comprehension, all of that is for you as librarians. That's for your benefit, for your background knowledge. This is not something that they want you to try to teach parents because it's too academic sounding, it's too confusing, and it really can put people off of an early literacy kind of program if things sound too hard. So they, this is not something that you want to teach parents. This is just for your own background knowledge. And, and again, that was something that in the first version of this, they did lots of stuff like this that I think was just too, it was too complicated and too confusing for people. So the overall goal of this program is to turn that research into good early literacy practice at home with simple early literacy practices that parents and children can enjoy together. Parents may not feel that they know how to help their children get ready to read, and so these, um, and the six skills that they did in the first version, they were too hard for people to remember. I couldn't even remember them half the time. I always had to look at my sheet when I was talking about them. So the second edition, they just go to those five practices that are there because they're non-intimidating, they're fun to do, and they like to use the word practice because it implies that you'll be doing these on a regular basis, which is also important because it's the accumulation of repeated interactions of these kinds of positive early literacy activities that will uh, contribute to that child being ready to read once they start school. 
do we have any questions so far on anything that we've covered? Because we're kind of ending that introduction period about kind of how this program got started and what the point of the program is. And we're going to move on. Yeah, um, to, if you do have any questions, uh, kind of like, no, I just want to say, if you do have any questions, anybody, type them into the question section. Or if you have a microphone and want to actually use it, just let me know in there. Please unmute me, and I will do that. And you can use your microphone to ask your question. Looks like in nothing not urgent is coming through right now. So. <laughs> All right, and that's fine. Um, in a nutshell, the reason that they decided to do this program was that they were seeing kids entering school not ready to learn and ready to read, and they wanted to see how the public library could address that need. So they did lots of scientific research, uh, or they, they read a lot of scientific research and came up with a program to identify some skills that kids needed and they worked to put together a program that would be a parent education initiative. Uh, so to show that public libraries can help children get ready to read. So part of what they want you to do in this program is to really do that parent education portion and to really try to educate parents on how important it is that they are their child's first teacher and that they take responsibility for teaching their children some of these skills and that they have the tools they need to do that. So these are some of the things that now we're going to pretend that we're all parents and caregivers in the audience and these are some of the kinds of things that you would show a parent in a workshop um, we're going to talk later about other ways that you can incorporate these kinds of things into story time. But if you were to do a parent workshop, you know, you could advertise you're going to, you know, every child ready to read, you know, pre-kindergarten success. You can think of lots of different ways that you could advertise this to parents. Um, you can also do these workshops for daycare workers, for um, Head Start programs. Uh, they a lot of times have parent evenings you can go to. Um, there's just there's tons of community agencies and community partners that you could go to and say, hey, I have this information on early literacy that I want to share with the people that work at your building or that the parents that come to your organization and try to get this word out. And that's part of what they encourage you to do. Um, so pretending we're at one of those workshops. We would start by saying something like, children who start kindergarten with good pre-reading skills have an advantage they're ready to learn to read. And you talk about how important it is, um, some of the things that I've said before about if they're, you know, reading at or above grade level by the end of second grade, that, you know, if then they're reading at or above grade level by the end of fourth grade, they're more likely to graduate from high school. So these early experiences are very important. You emphasize to the parent that they are the child's first teacher. They know their child best. And children love doing things with their parents, and they learn best working one-on-one -on -one with a parent. So that's where the parent's role comes in to be a good role model of reading and modeling read reading with their children and placing importance on it. And also, young, children's have, young children have short attention spans, and we all know that if we work with kids at all. And let the parent know that that's okay. You can do this for just short bits of time throughout the day. And that will actually, the accumulation of that will be very powerful in the child's skills and how they develop. If it's short, repeated interactions are powerful for children. Then you explain to the parents about the learning the code and understanding how children have to learn the letters and what they sound like. And all of that contributes to learning this decoding a code of what language is and what reading is. And this is a fun slide. Um, it says reading is learning the code. And then it gives you a little code there. Can anyone decode that for us? Let's see, we've got the bracket there, and that's I. And it spells out C-A-N and R-E-A-D. So I can read. So this is just a good example of how, you know, that doesn't make any sense to us as we first look at it, but we need to have a key to unlock that code. And that's what the pre-reading skills are for children. They're the keys 
to unlock the code of written language. But beyond that code, reading is understanding the meaning of what you read. And at the bottom there it says, Leah is hipple when she rocks with her mom. Well, if you don't know what the words hipple and rocks mean, you have no idea what this sentence means. So children could decode that and read it just like I can read that, but I don't know what that means. So getting your child a lot of background knowledge and reading lots of stories where they're learning new words and hearing new things is really important for that reading comprehension so that they can understand what they're reading later on when they learn to read. And to break down the skills a little bit for the parents, the what is decoding? What's well, noticing print? And this is easy to show children to point out letters on stop signs or words on a cereal box or, you know, words around your house, getting letter magnets like they have in the picture there. Um, and then once they notice print and they see it and they know what letters are, identifying those letter names and sounds, and then playing with those sounds, hearing with the sounds that make up the words. And this is where rhyming and singing songs and that, um, just playing with words and the sounds that make them up is a really important way to teach children these decoding skills. So what is comprehension? Breaking that down a little bit. It's knowing what words mean, which is having an extensive vocabulary. Again, with sounding out words, you could sound out the word hipple, but if you don't know what it means, you're not going to understand what you're reading. And and also, this involves lots of background knowledge about the world and about how it works. And this is where reading lots and lots of books is, is very helpful for children as they try to understand what they're reading. The more background knowledge they have about the world, the easier it is for them to figure out the meaning of what they're reading. And this is one area where I, I wish that they would have kept some of the research because in the first version of Every Child Ready to Read, they have these wonderful studies, and, and although they may be a little bit outdated now, there, there were some great studies about the, um, like how often a mother would speak with her child and how that correlated into a higher vocabulary and how that vocabulary just skyrocketed once the child was, you know, in toddler years and then on into school. And that the importance of speaking with your children and explaining words to them and not baby talking, but speaking to them a lot about lots of different things about what a powerful tool that was and how easy it was to do. And it doesn't require any kind of fancy program or computer software or doesn't even cost any money and that it's just a huge, huge help to your child when you speak with them and, and take the time to talk with them in this conversation. So on to some more examples of the five practices that help children get ready to read. Um, again, the, the idea of practices is saying that this is something that you should be doing on a daily or at least a regular basis. And that's what you want to get across to parents is that these practices are, are just that. They're something that should be incorporated into your daily life. And they should be easy to incorporate into your daily life. What I also like about this program is that a lot of the things that they suggest, like these five practices, this is not rocket science. And this is what a lot of people have been doing with their children forever. You know, it's natural to put a baby on your knee and bounce them around and say a song or a rhyme or something. But this, this whole initiative, this whole program is about being mindful of how important that is and realizing the power that that has to educate your children and to get them ready to read. And I love that about this, that none, nothing that they're asking you to do is difficult. And a lot of it is stuff that most parents would be doing with their children anyway. But this tells them why it's important, and it encourages them to do it with thoughtfulness, and, and maybe on a more regular basis than they would have otherwise. And one point that they make very clear, and they did in the first one as well, and, and this is um, research-based, um, backed up by all that, those studies that they um, looked at, 
is that parents should speak to their children in the language they know best because this encourages language fluency and it helps children understand the nuances of language, the structure of language, and gives them a wide variety of vocabulary and sentence structure. Um, a lot of people who come to the United States want their children to speak English and to learn English, and that is wonderful. But it is important that the parent also speaks to the child in the language in which they are most fluent. Because children are wired to learn language at a young age, and so they will easily be able to translate that knowledge of language into another language when they go to school, say they speak Spanish at home a lot. They'll be able to learn English and translate words into English, but they'll get a more rich language experience if the parent speaks to them in their native language. So this next section is just going to give a little preview of what the five practices are and what they can do to help their children learn these practices. And again, here's a difference between the first and the second version, too. In Every Child Ready to Read, the first version, they had all of those skills, and they had age-appropriate ways to teach all the skills. Well, in the second version, they go to the five practices, which are widely adaptable across a wide age range and will make it very easy to apply in a day-to-day in a -day kind of manner with children. So the first one is talking. Children learn about language by listening to parents talk and joining in the conversation. And this is where you would just encourage parents to talk with their children and to give them time to respond. It takes children a little while sometimes to formulate an answer, and you can tell their little brains are thinking, and it's important to be patient and to wait for the answer and not to just t say the answer because you're, you're waiting for them to say it and you know what they're going to say, so you just say it anyway. It's important to give them the chance to say the answer. That's good practice for them, and they'll get faster at it and better at it the more you let them interact that way. Um, when children are first learning to speak, it's, um, you know, they usually say like two word sentences like, you know, me hungry, and a great way to encourage that vocabulary development and, and that sentence development is to repeat what they say and add on to it. Say, oh yes, you're hungry. Do you think you want a sandwich? Or, you know, just expanding on what they say and give them a turn to speak back to you. And also to ask them questions about things they've done during the day or they want to do. Give them a chance to express their ideas and, and just have conversation throughout the day. And there are lots more. I'm just giving you a very brief picture about what some of the things that you would talk to a parent about are. There's lots more information on this in the parent workshops if you were to purchase the Every Child Ready to Read kit from ALA. So this is just a brief preview of what it would be like. And the next skill is singing. And songs are a natural way to learn language. What's great about singing is that it slows down the language so that children can hear those little different uh, sounds in the words. And often there will be a different note for each syllable of a word, like Mary had a little lamb. And we would never speak that way. So when we sing, we're really breaking the words and the sounds in the words down to smaller pieces to help children learn them. And there's lots of different activities you can do with singing. It also teaches new words, um, plays with songs and uh, the sounds and language. And again, there's lots more information on this in the in the work or the the kit that you can buy. Reading is, of course, very important, and that is traditionally the library's strongest, you know, part in, in helping children get ready to read is doing lots of reading together and shared reading. It helps develop vocabulary and comprehension. It gives them that background understanding of the world to understand what they read. It nurtures a love for reading. It motivates children to want to learn to read themselves if they enjoy being read to. And this is uh, another point in, in the workshop that I wish they would have left in some of the research that they had in the first one. They had a whole section in there about how you read is important as how much you read. 
And in this way, they encouraged you to have conversational reading with children, to share books and ask questions, and have lots of conversation around the book, asking them, what do you think will happen next? And you know, for younger children, just asking them, what color is that? What animal is it? Who do you see driving the truck? Different kinds of questions about books, and really getting children to interact with the text and the pictures, <clears throat> and how powerful that was in their language and vocabulary development. So they did leave that information out of, of the parent education part of it, but I do think it's important for you as librarians to have that research background knowledge too. And again, a child's interest in reading is an important predictor of later reading achievement. So those who want to learn to read, who enjoy being read to, usually become better readers and have more success as they enter school. <clears throat> Writing and reading go together. And this is something that did not seem a natural connection to me, which seems very silly now that I, uh, you know, once you think about it. But I thought about writing in the library. I think, oh, but the kids are going to write in the books, or maybe they'll color on, you know, the table or something. But really, writing is an important component of learning to read. And it's important to have places that children can write and practice writing in the home and in the library in areas that they can, you know, do a little damage, and, uh, but you can encourage them to do that. Um, because as they practice to write, it's just uh, that practices that eye-hand coordination. It exercises the muscles in their fingers and hands which will develop the fine motor control that they need to hold a pencil when they go to school and to learn to write letters and words. Again, it's just a pre-writing skill that will be important for their success once they get to school. And playing. Uh, this is my favorite skill, or my favorite practice, of course, and that children learn about language through different kinds of play. Uh, play helps children think abstractly and think symbolically. You know, the way that a ruler becomes a magic wand, or today they're living when dinosaurs are alive, or even their friend who becomes an astronaut, or a, or a chef, or whatever it is that they're playing. But while when they're playing, they think about the things in a symbolic way. One thing can stand for another. And this also helps children understand that written words stand for real concepts, and real objects, and experiences. Pretend play helps children develop oral language skills, to develop narrative skills as they practice putting their thoughts into words, and they make up games and sentences with other children. It also helps them develop narrative skills as children make up stories. And the more they practice with stories, the more they know about stories, how they have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And this just really helps develop their skills in that way. And a home environment can really help them get ready to read. And this is, again, where you make that assertion to the parents and caregivers that are there that they are the child's first teacher. And their home is where the child begins to learn to read. They can make their home a great place to learn by having books available in a place that's easy for them to get to, by having writing materials that the child can practice with in a safe environment, by having toys that encourage dramatic play, that encourage pretend, you know, puppets and dress-up clothes and you know, toy kitchens and toy tool sets and things that children can really pretend and imagine with. All of those kinds of toys are the kinds of things that will stimulate the child's development, that will stimulate those pre-reading skills that it's important to have. So at this point in the parent workshop is when you talk about, and I left this slide, this is one of the slides that's meant to be customized with your own library's logo and um, adding your own programs here, but this is when you tell the people that you're the community people or the parents that you're speaking to about how your library helps children get ready to read. What is it that you have that will help children do this? Does your library have a nice uh, children's area that includes puzzles, uh, coloring pages, puppets, different kinds of toys that stimulate children 
that give them a chance to come and play in a safe environment. Does your library have a story time? Does it have a baby story time, a sign language story time? What is it that your library offers that, that will help children get ready to read? And again, you stress to parents that it doesn't matter if the child is four days old or four years old. You have things that will help your child get ready to read and get ready to learn when they enter kindergarten. And again, just another sample um, slide that you could use about talking and reading. And this might be where you share, oh, sorry, that says singing. <laughs> Um, about different programs that you have for, for people in the community. And they have all different kinds of things just to remind the parents. Um, included in the Every Child Ready to Read uh, materials, if you were to purchase this from ALA, they have information on, on and scripts and PowerPoints and all kinds of things for these other workshops, fun for parents and children fun with letters, fun with words, fun with science and math, which I think it's great that they're including science and math along with these kind of English language um, learning opportunities. They also have lots of great handouts. And one of the big differences between Every Child Ready to Read, the first edition and the, and the second edition, is that the workshops can be done with the parents alone or can be done with the children present. And that was one of the big hardships of, of doing workshops before is that they were designed just for the parent. But parents with young children often bring those young children along and it became very difficult to try to set up child care while the parents were, were doing the Every Child Ready to Read program and to have something simultaneously for the children to do so the parents could focus on what they were doing. The workshops that they have now are designed with the children in mind, are designed to to have the children attend them. And again, just another slide that you could use to tell people how to get a library card, how to find you online, give you their information. And then um, everychildreadytoread.org is the official, well, sorry, is the official website for the Every Child Ready to Read program. It's where you can find lots more materials on the program if you're interested. It's where you can buy the um, the, um, the big manual that they sell, and it is, I believe, $180, so it is quite expensive. But as I said, if you were thinking about doing this program at your library, it is invaluable. It has tons of great resources and lots of background information for you to present some nice uh, workshops for the public. But what I'd like to highlight next is kind of um, more how do you incorporate this? What does this mean to us as librarians? What does all this research and this information mean to us as we work in a public library with parents? And for me, what I found when after I had read and studied all this, because um, I was part of the, the first, one of the first trainings in Ohio when they, when they started rolling out this program. And to me, it just knocked my socks off that these early experiences with children were so important to their future development. And it was something that I really felt powerfully about that the public library should be involved in. We see tons of preschoolers come through our doors, you know, though, and, and we should be meeting their needs. We should be addressing these kinds of issues with them. And we should be telling the parents about how important this time in their life is and that it's okay if children want to read the same book over and over again. And it's okay if they want to sing songs all the time or they're trying to talk all the time. And that those are great things for kids and for their development. And it really spoke to me in, in a way that the library could be meeting a need in the community. Um, so what we started doing was um, we started just being mindful about these kinds of skills and these kinds of early literacy practices as we had our story times. So as I said, I did do parent workshops and community people workshops and uh, workshops for early childhood educators and things, but they were sporadically attended at best. And 
what we found would be more helpful would be to reach the parents who were already coming to the library and bringing their kids in and trying to get this information out to our parents about the importance of getting your child ready to read and how they could do that when they were already coming to the library. So we incorporated these kinds of skills into our story times just in a more thoughtful way. We maybe talked more about letter sounds or we made sure to pick stories that used rich complicated language and we talked about that rich complicated language and we would make sure to explain it and talk about unusual words that were there. We also decided to develop a play area in our library. We had a story time room that when it was not being used for story time was not being used at all. So we set up toys and play areas in there that would just encourage dramatic play and would encourage the kids to pretend and to be imaginative, to develop those language skills and those oral skills and in the library. And we also made a big effort to educate the parents in a very informal way, but just talk about what kinds of skills they develop as they play with puppets, or what kind of puzzles, uh, or what puzzles did to help children. They were a first step in learning the differences in shapes and they have to learn the differences in shapes before they can learn the differences in letters. So really playing with puzzles is a way to help your child learn the alphabet later on. And we just tried to make it very clear to parents that there was lots of little things in their day-to-day -day life that they could do to teach their children these skills and to get their child ready to read in a way that didn't cost them any money, wasn't a formalized program, and it wasn't overly complicated. And that we really felt was what our role as the public library, we really found that that fit for us. And, and it will look different in every community based on how many kids you have, how many preschoolers you already see coming into your library, and the different needs in every community. But I think what's important is to think about early childhood literacy, how important it is in your community, and see where your library can meet that need for your unique situation. What is it that your library can do that will help children get ready to read? And like I said, that'll be different for everyone. So that kind of wraps up uh, uh, the brief overview um, of the program. Are there any questions? Anyone want to ask anything? Or if anyone has had experience with this before, please feel free to, to contribute. Yes, if anyone has any questions, you can type them in if you want to share anything you know about the program. I noticed that most of the people that said answered your question in the beginning um, said they had um, not actually done it themselves, um, but probably had heard about it. Um. I think it's just important to remember that this is, um, you know, whether you choose to, to purchase the very expensive manual or if you want to borrow ours from the Northeast Library System, let me know if you want to take a look at it and see what is in it and see if it's something that you would find helpful or useful in your community. You're more than welcome to do that. Mm -hmm. um, we do have one question here. Have you had good reception from non-English speakers' parents? And I will say in um, in my situation when I did the programs, we did have one uh, in particular that I remember a, a non-English speaking parent came who was shocked that she should be speaking in her native tongue to her child and she had been trying so hard to learn English that she was trying to teach her daughter English and she felt it was important that she speak to her in English. And when she heard that, really, she should be also speaking in her native tongue to get that fluency and richness of language, she was really quite surprised by that. So she said she would make um, a deliberate effort to try to do that in the future. Um, so um, that, was, that was an interesting outcome, I thought, as well. Yeah, that wouldn't be, you'd think, yeah, people, I'm sure, instinctually think the opposite. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's just so, I, I just find this very, it, it's so important that we reach children when they are young to give them these skills and, you know, it makes such a difference in their whole life. I mean, 
this is important, an important time in their life, that birth to age five or six when they enter school is hugely important in their language development, in their brain formation. And again, that's something that they left out entirely of the second edition of Every Child Ready to Read. Um, but in the first edition, they have lots of research on brain development and about how early experiences can change the development of children's brains. And also that when children feel loved and secure, they have better um, memory, they can hold on to memories better because of the increased serotonin in the brain. So mm -hmm. really feeling loved and safe is as important to learning as, as anything else because they won't hold on to those memories as easily if they're under a lot of stress or they're in an environment where they do not feel safe. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, definitely. Um, I just noted a few things I noticed about during your presentation. I was very um, impressed and glad to see how this program is based on all that research, that yeah. it's that real background and information. And I know, as you said, you know, don't drown the parents and a lot of that stuff to scare them away, but it's nice to know that it was there and that it came from real good um, research. Absolutely, and I think that's one of the strongest points of this program is because you know, we, we know that reading is good for kids. Okay, yes. We all know that. We're librarians and we love reading and that we know. But do we have the information to back it up? You know, do we have the scientific proof to say why this is important? Mm -hmm. And one thing I always said to parents was like, you know, why? So we all sing the Eat and See Weensy Spider with our kids when they're little. You know, that's a mm -hmm. song that just about everybody sings. Why is that important? And this program gives you the backup of why that's that's not just a silly thing to do that's actually teaching them something very important and so it gives you that backup to say there's a reason why we do story time in the library and there's a reason why we do all these kinds of things mm -hmm. okay and we do have another question um, someone I'm a children's librarian and I'm not that comfortable working with infants do you have any suggestions for how to incorporate these skills with those under one year that's a great uh, question and um, I actually, when we did story time, we had a, a what we called a baby time, and we did it was from birth up to age two, and we did about it was really it was the program itself was about half an hour, but the structured part of it was about ten to fifteen minutes long because the babies just get wiggly after that. But what we did was have the child sit on the parent's lap. And um, we would do little rhymes, like the parents would move the child, the baby's hands and, and do um, like open shut them or just play peekaboo or do simple rhymes like the Incy Weensy Spider and we would sing and do finger plays a lot um, and tickle rhymes or bouncing rhymes because all of those play with language and explore language and introduce new vocabulary. And then we would share a couple of really short books if we could. Sometimes we just had the parents share books with the baby on their lap because um, young infants especially can't see more than about a foot away from them. So sharing a book at the front of the room is not developmentally appropriate. It's got to be something that's closer to them. Um, so we did that. And then for like the last 15 or 20 minutes, we, we got out those, um, you know, uh, shakers and rattles and little toys and things for the babies to play with and we gave the parents the time to talk to each other and it almost became more like a mom's and dad's group that came to the library to talk to each other uh, but it was also very beneficial for the children and again I thought that was a perfect fit because if the aim of this is to educate parents that's really what we were doing because everything we would do we would send home sheets of the rhymes that we did that day and say you know, these are great things that you can do with your baby during the week, and we'll see you back next time, and we'll learn some new ones. But really, we tried to use it as a model for what they could be doing at home. Does, hopefully that answers your question there. <laughs> and we have another question. Um, I am a Spanish speaker, but because I am the main parent interacting, I have emphasized reading in English now my kids are older. Do you think parents should keep speaking in the native language all through life? That, um, I would say as the child acquires language fluency and if your children are older and they've already, you know, acquired either the English or Spanish language but in a fluent way, 
that then that would not be um, as necessary anymore because they've already um, become fluent in a language, if that makes sense. Um, I'm certainly no scientist and I don't know, but it would, my interpretation of the study would be that it's important to speak in that fluent language as the children are learning language. And once they have learned and acquired a fluency of language, that then that would not become as important. Great, and you are welcome. And are there any other questions or um, issues that came up as we were exploring these questions that anyone would like to ask? I'm going to take that as a no, I think. What do yep. you think, Krista? Yeah, it doesn't look like anybody has any urgent issues. <laughs> um, okay. But it's great, you know, as you guys saw, as you all saw, um, you can always go to the website there, everychildreadytoread.org, for more information. Um, we will, when, we, when I put the recording up, we will add a link to that as well to it, so you'll be able to um, get to it quickly. Oh, you do have a comment there from one of our librarians here in Nebraska. Oh, thank you, Laura. Yeah. <laughs> Loves this program, would like to try it at the Stanton Public Library. Great. Go there and find the information. And of course, I'm sure, um, Jessica, you said anyone could contact you if they do want to ask you more about it, too. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And um, we do have a copy of the manual if you wanted to borrow it and take a look at what it offers and the different kind of programs it has. Yeah, sure. Um, you are certainly more than welcome to take a look at it. Absolutely. Definitely a good idea. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, yeah, Laura, give Jessica a call and she can uh, loan it out to you guys. Okay, I am whoops, taking back control here so you guys can see my screen here. I just had the uh, website open. I was looking at it as you were talking. <laughs> so this is the, just so you can see the uh, Every Child Ready to Read website uh, where all the information is on there. So... Uh, looks like we don't have any urgent qu last minute questions, so I think we will wrap it up for the day. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was great. Um, like I said, a lot of great information and um, yeah, even though I don't actually work at a library, I'm glad that this kind of program is out there for the kids to get and the parents to become more involved in the um, their children's reading. I know. Yeah. I was read to a lot as a child and I'm sh and brought to the library constantly, so I'm sure that had something to do with how I ended up as a librarian today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did. All right. So thank you very much, Jessica. And um, as I said, the session was recorded and it will be available later today. You'll all be notified that um, when it is ready. And I hope you'll join us next week on Encompass Live when our topic that we just set up, you may not have heard about this one yet, is about Cat Express and Web Dewey. We here in Nebraska have group discounts for both of those services, and I will be um, presenting on that along with Emily Nimsikant, the cataloging librarian here at the Nebraska Library Commission, to tell you about those two um, services and how you can save if you want to um, purchase them through us here at the Library Commission. So that will be our session for next week. So thank you very much, Jessica, for uh, speaking with us today. My and, pleasure. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And we will see you next week on Encompass Live. Bye-bye. <laughs>